Chapter 1. Searching for Your Soulmate Many of the frustrations experienced by today's singles seem like problems unique to our time and technological setting. Not hearing back on a text, agonizing over what really is your favorite movie for your online dating profile, wondering whether you should teleport over some roses to that girl you had dinner with last night. Hey, so if the teleportation thing isn't figured out by June 2015, we'll lose that line, right? Okay, I just want to make sure. You, well, the science advisor dudes were like, yeah, teleportation will be out like April, so it, it'll it probably be a big thing by June, so that's why I'm saying it. All right, thanks, guys. These kind of quirks are definitely new to the romantic world, but as I investigated and interviewed for this book, I found that the changes in romance and love are much deeper and bigger in scale than I realized. Right now, I'm one of millions of young people who are in a similar place. We are meeting people, dating, getting into and out of relationships, all with the hope of finding someone we truly love and with whom we share a deep connection. We may even want to get married and start a family too. This journey seems fairly standard now, but it's wildly different from what people did even just decades ago. To be specific, I now see that our ideas about two things, searching and the right person, are completely different from what they used to be, which means our expectations about how courtship works are too. Donuts for Interviews, a visit to a New York retirement community. If I wanted to see how things have changed over time, I figured that I should start by learning about the experience of the older generations still around today. And that meant talking to some old folks. To be honest, I tend to romanticize the past, and though I appreciate all the conveniences of modern life, Sometimes I yearn for simpler times. Wouldn't it be cool to be single in a bygone era? I take a girl to a drive-in movie. We go have a cheeseburger and a malt at the diner. And then we make out under the stars in my old-timey convertible. Granted, this might have been tough in the 50s given my brown skin tone and racial tensions at the time, but in my fantasy, racial harmony is also part of the deal. So, to learn about romance in this era, Eric and I went down to a retirement community on the Lower East Side of New York City to interview some seniors. We came armed with a big box of Dunkin' Donuts and some coffee, tools that the staff had said would be key to convincing the old folks to speak with us. Sure enough, when the seniors caught a whiff of donuts, they were quick to pull up chairs and start answering our questions. One 88-year-old man named Alfredo took to the donuts very quickly. About 10 minutes into the discussion, to which he'd contributed nothing but his age and name, he looked at me with a confused expression threw up his donut-covered hands, and left. When we came back a few days later to do more interviews, Alfredo was back. The staff explained that Alfredo had misunderstood the purpose of the previous meeting. He thought we wanted to talk to him about his time in the war, but he was now fully prepared to answer questions about his own experiences in love and marriage. Once again, he was pretty quick to take down a donut, and then, faster than you could wipe the last few crumbs of a French cruller off your upper lip, Alfredo was gonzo. I can only hope that a similarly easy way to scheme free donuts presents itself to me when I go into retirement. Thankfully, others were more informative. Victoria, age 68, grew up in New York City. She got married when she was 21 to a man who lived in the same apartment complex, one floor above her. I was standing in front of my building with some friends and he approached me, Victoria said. He told me he liked me very much and asked if I'd like to go out with him. I didn't say anything. He asked me two or three more times before I agreed to go out with him. It was Victoria's first date. They went to a movie and had dinner at her mom's house afterward. He soon became her boyfriend, and after a year of dating, her husband. They'd been married for 48 years. When Victoria first told me her story, it had aspects I expected to be common among the group. She married very young, her parents met her boyfriend almost immediately, and they shifted into marriage fairly quickly. I figured that the part about marrying someone who lived in her same building was kind of random. But then, the next woman we spoke with, Sandra, 78, said she got married to a guy who lived just across the street. Stevie, 69, married a woman who lived down the hall. Jose, 75, married a woman who lived one street over. Alfredo married someone from across the street, probably the daughter of the neighborhood donut shop owner. It was remarkable. In total, 14 of the 36 seniors I spoke with had ended up marrying someone who lived within walking distance of their childhood home. People were marrying neighbors who lived on the same street, in the same neighborhood, 
and even in the same building.